very well. Hey, Laura. if it's really bright. It's not bad. Yeah. I can't see now, but it was... <laughs> no, I'm just joking. It's fine. Yeah. Ready, Ellen? Okay. We'll just go. Okay. Hi, everyone. Welcome back. Hope you have your coffee refreshed. We're going to get ready for the next session. So I have the privilege every year of honoring our effective practice entries from across the SUNY system. And this is the really fun part for me uh, because I just get to showcase all the good work that everybody's doing. Um, so I really enjoy moderating this panel. We have um, some folks joining us via the Zoom, which I'll pop over to in a little bit. But I just want to give you a little bit of an overview of the program in case you're not entirely familiar with it. The award program was launched in 2015. This was a way for us to try to annually recognize and celebrate all the outstanding work that everyone is doing on our campuses. Since its inception in 2015, we have showcased almost 40 entries representing 18 SUNY campuses. So that's exciting. This is just the uh, mission statement, the goal of the program. For the past four years, we've recognized exemplary effective practices in the online teaching and learning track. And this year, we've expanded the program tracks to include recognition of effective online course quality practices, online student services and concierge practices, enrollment and recruitment practices, and program partnership practices. So you will be hearing about those tracks referenced throughout the presentation today. We are fortunate to be joined by four of our program participants who submitted entries in the online teaching and learning track and the online program partnerships track. I'm going to pull up the Zoom in a moment, but I wanted you to see their names and their entries. And I'm going to turn the floor over to them to share their effective practices. They're going to present that. We also have one face-to-face -face participant in the room. And after they do that, then I'll come back and we'll talk about the next steps and actually get to conferring some of the awards. So our first uh, entry was submitted by Jesse Redlow from Monroe Community College, titled Video Instruction for Online Restaurant Management Concepts. This is in the online teaching and learning track. Hi, Jesse. Hi, Erin. All right. All right. In the room. There you are. Nope. Are we good to go? Hang on. I can see you, but I don't think the room can see you yet, so... So it's up. Hmm. Uh, no. In Zoom or on the desktop? Here we go. We'll try. Is that a desktop feature? Yeah, but I don't. So he's he's right there, but. Oh, Jeff knows the shortcut keys. Awesome. Justin. Yay! You're all in the room. <laughs> all right, Jesse. I will turn it over to you. Go ahead. Okay, great. Thank you, Aaron. I appreciate the introduction. Can everybody in the room hear me? How are the acoustics in the room? Good. Everybody can hear me fine? Yeah. All right. Fantastic. So, um, as Aaron said, my name is Jesse Redlow. I'm an adjunct faculty member at Monroe Community College. I teach in the hospitality management program, and I, I developed a brand new online course over the summer for our program. Uh, it's for our menu planning course, which has never been taught online because it has a lot of hands-on concepts. So it was a very tricky project. I have to give a shout out to Andrea Gilbert and Larry Dugan of the MCC Virtual Campus for making it possible for me to create this course and to present with you today. What I'd like to start off by doing is I have a few brief slides I'm going to go to a screen share and see if I can bring them up properly. Let's see. Uh, yep, we're seeing them. And, um, let's see if this works. Can everybody see the slides? Yes. Are we good? Okay. 
So I call this presentation Video Instruction for Online Restaurant Management Concepts. Um, the reason I call it, so the course I focused on is Food Service Administration 107, Menu Planning. Um, this is actually one of the more complicated courses that we have in our curriculum because it bridges theory with practice. So it's very important for our online students, for any of our hospitality students. I wanted to give you a quick overview of the learning outcomes of the course. In particular, um, trying to learn about recipe costing and how different costs affect how we plan a menu and the profitability of our operation. These are concepts that students have historically struggled with in the face-to-face -face version of the course. So one of my big challenges in designing the online version of the course was how do I get across these demonstrations? And, what, and I turn to video technology to do that. So how I designed my course was I organized it into 16 modules. Each module begins with an overview video where they can see me and I verbally walk them through all requirements. In addition, I, I type all the requirements out. That way, depending on a student's learning style, they can see it in writing and they can also hear it from me, um, kind of engaging with differentiated instructional ideas. Students do assigned reading. They'll watch a video lecture and or demonstration to see the material in action and then they'll engage in an activity which usually allows them to apply the concepts in a collaborative manner. And thus far, it's been a very effective uh, program. But I don't want to spend too much time actually talking about it. I want you guys to see it. So I'm going to switch off of uh, these slides and actually show you one of my video demonstrations from the course, assuming that I can pull it up successfully. Let me see if this will work. We'll do a screen share to desktop. Okay. So I'm going to show a I'm going to show a brief clip of this video on yield testing, which is one of the more difficult concepts in the course. Please let me know if everybody can hear it and see it properly. We can see it, but we don't have the audio, which. It's very, very low anyway. If there's anything that you want to share like over it, you can talk over it while we're watching it. So Jesse, we can see the video, but we can't hear it. Oh, it can, okay, you can't hear it? Right, it's very, very low. So m maybe you can talk us through what we're seeing. Yeah, let me, let me just actually stop this screen share then. Um, sure. So it should be my face back at this point? Yes. Okay, so what that video was gonna show in kind of a hands-on format was we weigh, out, we weigh out the carrots and see that we have a pound from the bag. And then I go through and I prep the carrots. I do the peel, I cut off the ends, get them chopped into the right size. And then by the time we do that, I weigh them and it's down to 13.9 ounces. So that's what we call yield testing in hospitality. And the point of that concept is to explain to students that if you actually need a pound of finished product for your plate, you have to order more than a pound because you're gonna lose some of it to trim. And that's a concept that students have historically struggled with and we usually teach it in a hands-on format in the kitchen. So this video demonstration was my online substitution um, for that process. And likewise, I have a lot of other videos for menu pricing and for recipe costing that do the same thing, kind of take that hands-on and bring it to life. So what I've found is that these videos have increased student success so far on both the formative and summative assessments that go with these modules. The average has been pretty high out of 25 students. I've had over 20 students getting A's and B's in these modules. So, so far the practice has been quite effective. And I don't want to go over my six minute time allotment because I know we're on a tight schedule, Aaron. So at this point, I'll stop and take any questions. Thank you, Jesse. Let me, I'll ask the audience any questions for Jesse while we have them, Andrea? So, 
so your video production, how do you do that? Can you explain the process at Monroe? Sure, so the video production, um, some of the videos I shoot myself from home on my laptop, like my module overview videos were shot. That one in the kitchen was professionally done. We have a multimedia uh, designer at MCC who's fantastic. So he actually went into the kitchen with me with a professional video camera. You don't see it, but I'm microphoned in that video. And he, we spent about an hour in there and he zoomed in on certain aspects, did some nice editing. It was a very laborious process up front, but definitely worth it in the end. Other questions? Yeah. Um, are your videos ADA compliant? Yes, my videos are ADA compliant. They do have su they do have subtitles. Um, I do I worked with some folks at MCC to ensure that. Brandon. So having the video, did that reduce the time um, that students would need to see the concept demonstrated compared to actually seeing it live in the kitchen? Having that video, did that cut the time? Um, I, so are, are, is the question, it, it, takes a, it took about the same amount of time in the video as it would to do in the actual classroom. Yeah. It was about the same time frame. Okay, I think that was the question. I don't... I'm sure it wouldn't have taken. How long do you think that it would take to do that demo? Um, to do that demo, to do that demo in the kitchen in a real face -to, in a face-to-face -face class would be about 10 to 15 minutes, and the video is just a hair under 10 minutes long. And, okay, there you go. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with all of you. Great. Thank you, Jesse. So our next entry um, was submitted by Stephanie Afanito, and Stephanie is from the University at Albany. Her entry was titled, Interactive Introductions with Google Slides to Build a Learning Community, Online Teaching, and Learning Track. Stephanie, hi. Hello, thank you. Can you hear me okay as well? Yes, we can. Okay, all right. Um, so as Erin mentioned, I am a faculty member at the University of Albany um, in the Department of Literacy, Teaching and Learning. And we have multiple programs that are both on campus online. And I teach across both of them. Um, over the years, I have found ways to replicate the content in the ways that I'm happy with teaching new and pre-service teachers. Uh, but the one thing that I, I struggled to replicate online was that same sense of informal, collegial community building that seems more readily done in an on-campus class. You know, we can chat as they come in. I can learn about them on break, who has the Dunkin' Donuts coffee, who has the Starbucks coffee, who's running in late and had car trouble. All those little interactions just make a, it, to me, seem to make the on-campus community a little bit more connected. And I've, I've worked really hard to try to find ways to do that online from using things like VoiceThread or Flipgrid or Padlet or just tools that bring faces and voices to our online classes. Um, but I still wasn't happy and until now. Um, so this past semester, I, I gave this idea a try and I was, I was pretty shocked at how easy it was, how easy it was for the students and how much of an impact it made in my online classes. So I'm going to share my screen as well so that I can show you what I'm talking about. So let's see. Are you able to see that in a second, maybe? No, not yet. Not yet. Well, oh, yep, that's coming up. Oh, the dreaded not responding. I thought that wasn't going to end well. OK, so you can <laughs> see it now? Yes, there it is. Okay, so this is just uh, an example of what I've done. And unfortunately, I, I, I wish I could go into the class and pull up our actual class presentations with all 25 students. But to protect their privacy, I obviously am only using my own as an example. 
in an attempt to try to replicate what we've done. So each one of my online classes, I've created an, a Google presentation that is editable by all who enter it in an attempt to have students better introduce themselves. Now, my previously, my students introduced themselves online in Blackboard in a discussion post that was typically boring um, and academic. Their name, where they graduated from, where they are in their program, and that was it. And I, I wanted something more. So this originally came from an idea from Eric Kurtz. You can see the, the name in the website at the, the bottom of this slide. And this is what I asked students to do. Um, I asked them to go into the presentation, to go to the first blank slide or add their own, and to create a slide that represented who they were. So there was a place for their picture in that old fashioned Polaroid which isn't old fashioned, I guess, anymore. They're coming back, but there's a place for their picture right there. And then you can see, I asked them to tell me and the rest of the class about themselves, their interests, families, sports teams, pets, television, anything goes, something to help us connect in this way. Um, I gave them directions on how to easily replace the picture in that frame with their picture so that we could see each other. I asked them to personalize the slide with colors, choosing their own font, um, adding clip art images to represent who they were as well, and then encourage them to browse the other slides and comment to say hello. So I'm pulling up mine as an example. So I can't share theirs. I just put my picture there. Um, I talked about my family. I joked about how I'm often checking into my online class from a baseball field and Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, talked about my vices, coffee, frosting, and peanut butter, a couple polar opposites, but they all work. My dogs, my favorite color. So I wanted to bring in the personal side and kind of humanize the, the interactions a bit. Now, what I can't show you are their slides, but they were varied. Um, they really personalized them, made them unique. And the thing that struck me, um, well, a couple things came out of this. On the Blackboard posts, when it was time for students to reply to their classmates, um, it wasn't a very robust conversation. Some students may not have had any replies other than myself, and some may have had maybe two or three. Here, the minimum number of comments per slide was three, and the highest was 12. So the interaction was pretty high, um, and I, I, I I hypothesize that's because of the ease of doing this. It's a very quick and easy thing to do. No usernames were required, no new um, Google passwords, although most students already had Google accounts. And it was more similar to something that they may have done on social media, which was quick and easy and gave a picture of the student um, and really just built that informal community that hadn't quite been able to do. I didn't ask students, but I did have eight students email me on their own, thanking me for the activity, saying they've never really been able to see their classmates other than the, the minuscule icon in Blackboard. Um, so they took the initiative to let me know that it was helpful as well as a great model for their own classrooms, which as a teacher educator, I'm always trying to model something they could bring to their elementary classrooms and many of the, the teachers that were there um, in the course, two of them tried it, and a couple of them said it's something that be, they would be willing to do. So given how easy it was to create, how low stakes it was for the students, and how much positive reaction was generated, we really built a community um, around this. It's definitely something that I recommend other online instructors give a try. Thanks. Anybody have any questions? Sure. Um, yes. Question. <clears throat> Stop my share. So, where did the students respond to each other or comment on the slides? Was it in uh, the Google Slides or was it in a place in Blackboard? It was on the slides, and of course, I just stopped sharing the slide. Um, but when, you, when students would comment, the comments would appear on the right side of the slide in a little column. 
And um, which was great is not only could they comment, but then they could have these little miniature conversations and reply to each other that stayed on that right side of the screen. Much easier than scrolling through a Blackboard thread. Other questions, sure. So if you had a student who preferred not to share their photo, did you have some alternative for them? I did not have any yeah. students who chose not to share, um, but if my alternative would have just been, that's okay. Um, and instead just talk about yourselves and maybe put um, a picture of something that represents you or something that you enjoy instead. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Okay, thank you, Stephanie. Thank you. And for our last virtual participant, uh, we have Bridget Nettleton from Empire State College. Her entry was titled Connecting Pre-Licensure and Degree Completion Nursing Programs, What Seems to Be Working. This is in the Online Program Partnership track. Hi, Bridget. Hi, Erin. Thank you so much, and thank you, everyone that's in the room, for this opportunity to, to speak with you this morning. I see some of my colleagues there. Hello. <laughs> Great to see you. Um, I'm the low-tech dean, so I don't have any slides to share, um, but uh, I would love to talk to you about a partnership that we created with uh, two different models at two different community colleges. Um, the first partnership was created with SUNY Ulster. Uh, we uh, had some conversations with the, uh, the nursing chair there, with the provost and then the president. And they did not have an RN to BS degree option for their graduates in the Ulster area. So they wanted to join us in a partnership to create a seamless transition for their graduates um, to come to our RN to BS program. And we have, uh, we deliver our program entirely online. So it really meets the needs of working nurses who do a lot of shift work, they work weekends and so forth. So um, as a result of that, we created an enhanced MOU with Ulster and provided within that MOU the opportunity to teach up to two of our upper division online nursing courses. Uh, delivered there at their campus to graduates of their program and to their senior nursing students if they wanted to get a jump start on their baccalaureate degree. Uh, that went very, very well. We had a full-time nurse faculty member from Empire State College who delivered the course in a hybrid format. She met with the students three times throughout the 15-week term and then did the rest of the content online with them. And we found that they really felt very supported. The students that participated felt very supported by having the presence of this full-time faculty member there on their campus. The downside of it as we evaluated it afterwards was that it wasn't really cost effective for us to be able to divert a full-time faculty member to uh, teach a course that really only had about 15 students in it, and we teach up to 25 students in our sections. So um, we tried that. We are in the process of seeing if there's some way that we can do a little different model with Ulster. In the meantime, we began conversations with Rockland, uh, SUNY Rockland Community College. Um, their provost had seen the um, the press release about Ulster and said, I want in on that deal. We want to have Empire State College come and be able to offer our nursing graduates the same kind of option um, because we, we don't have a baccalaureate degree completion option here in our area. What we did in that case was that we hired a nurse faculty member from Rockland to uh, teach with us as an adjunct faculty member. So very well versed in nursing, um, had an opportunity to see the quality of the courses that we offer at Empire State College. That individual has taught with us for uh, two semesters now. And now we have an on the ground cheerleader for our program there at Rockland. She's talking to her junior and senior nursing students about the fact that she teaches with Empire. She recognizes the quality of Empire 
and um, she's really recruiting for us uh, at no extra cost other than being a faculty member here and uh, feels very supported in that adjunct faculty role. The implications of this partnership, and we're going to try and recreate this model, hopefully with as many community colleges as we can, is that there is a new law that was signed into effect, um, not actually in December of 17, that's going to require nurses to get their bachelor's degree within 10 years of their initial licensure. So we're really building on the solid foundation that community colleges provide to get individuals eligible for licensure as a registered nurse, and then building on that to get them to their baccalaureate degree. So the new law is called the BSN in 10. Um, and so we really want to try and be part of the solution about how do we get people on the path and to their baccalaureate degrees within that time frame. We're also trying to respond to industry's demand for more baccalaureate prepared nurses. So this was a partnership that um, I, I think both of them were successful. Uh, some, uh, I think the second one with Rockland is, a, is more cost effective for us. So that's probably the model that we'll replicate. But we really are feeling very good about the inroads that we've created with these two kind of new partnership programs. Thank you, Bridget. I don't, are there questions welcome. about the nursing program partnerships? We have quite room. Brandon has a question. Who who pays the faculty at Rockland? Is that shared or? No, we pay the faculty member at Rockland. She works for them full time. She teaches for us as an adjunct, and so we pay her what we would pay an adjunct. The beauty of it, though, is that her section of the course is open to all of our students. So she may have some of her graduates in her section, but she, we can give her a full section of coursework, and uh, she's loving it. Other questions? Okay, not seeing any. Um, I'm going to transition to our face-to-face um, -face presenters. And so to the Zoom participants, I'm going to um, close the Zoom so you won't be on screen, but you're welcome to stay in and listen if you would like to or drop off as you need to. But first, I just want to thank you for joining us this way today and presenting virtually. Thank you again. Thanks, Erin. Thank you, Erin. Come on up. All right, I guess they're going to be in the corner. Will this work, Jeff, just to keep the slides up? Will that be fine? Okay. So, joining us in person, we have Robin Sullivan from uh, UB and Sheree over here, sorry, from uh, SUNY Binghamton. And your slides are right in here, so we don't have to do uh, a whole lot. We just need to. Oh, yeah, that's the Zoom folks, or the Zoom slide. Oh, is there a different display I need to switch again? <laughs> I don't know how to do that. It's got to be the display. I'm just not sure how to. I know. Well, you did the magic last time, Jeff, so I'll let you do it again. Let's give it a shot here. It's like the display resolution here is. From beginning or from, uh, no, from current. current slide? Yeah. <laughs> Better? Better? Keep it good. I think 
everybody. I'm Robin Sullivan and Cherie Van Putten is here with me and we are going to just briefly introduce the SUNY sponsored Exploring Emerging Technologies for Lifelong Learning and Success. Um, the URL is on the screen but during lunch I will also provide some marketing materials that you can bring back to your campuses and share the information widely. So for short, we call it EM Tech MOOC. You can also find us on social media using that hashtag. It's basically a discovery learning opportunity to be able to explore and reflect on emerging technology tools. The idea is to be able to identify the value and implications, um, both for career and personal advancement. In addition, the um, Emerging Technologies MOOC provides um, strategies for lifelong learning habits to keep pace with technology change. So we all know technology changes. Something that might be here today is gone in the afternoon or might go, um, you know, might get an improved interface that you have to learn how to um, proceed with that new tool. This online learning opportunity is targeted to all learners. So it involves uh, students, faculty, staff, and anyone across the globe who has an interest to stay current with technology tools. The um, MOOC is based in Coursera and it has five um, week long modules. They take about an hour each week and it's organized around the four C's of 21st century learners. Those um, modules, the first one is communication, or actually the second one is communication and collaboration. Next one is on creativity and critical thinking. Throughout the Coursera-based MOOC, um, you're guided through these concepts with some videos. Um, many people throughout SUNY have helped put this together for um, a long time, and you'll see snippets and um, input from many people. Thank you, Chris, for starring in our lifelong learning MOOC. Uh, the, the course is actually in two parts. So it has the Coursera-based MOOC as the supportive learning community in the discussions, and then the EM Tech Wiki is a database that is growing, um, filled with technology tools, and it can also be used as a standalone resource. The objective of putting the technology tools outside of Coursera and into a wiki is that we are crowdsourcing um, the value of the tools. People can rate them and put the better ones up to the top, and also we can keep this content more up to date than having to go in once a semester and making sure the links didn't break on us. The learning process is you go through the MOOC and you read and view the course act, uh, materials. Then you go and explore a wiki tool, do a discovery activity, reflect on your learning, put that into your portfolio that you build throughout the MOOC, and throughout the process, you earn digital badges, and uh, if you complete the course, a Coursera-based certificate. The rewards are, at the end, you'll have a completed portfolio. You can earn digital badges to put on your CV and in your social media. Um, SUNY folks across every campus can earn a free verified Coursera certificate, um, and also just the intrinsic rewards of being a lifelong learner. Um, yesterday marked our year anniversary from the launch, um, so that's great. We have uh, 3,665 registered learners and 91 completers so far, but across the world. I find that so fascinating to deal with countries I had no idea were there and talking to the people from all over the world and different perceptions um, and different activities that they're involved with. Um, just a little bit of data, so this one uh, graph shows that, um, um, that we have a post survey that we give out and many people, uh, I think it's a little bit less than 80%, feel that they have um, their ability to use emerging technologies for professional and personal purposes has increased and also the feelings about their use of 
of using technology tools. And that's one thing that we really want. We just want people to get a little bit of more comfort and be able to explore and uh, apply these to, in a hands-on way to their own situations. There's a lot more data on the website. We have a great infographic and a couple testimonials and comments from the participants that you can go onto the site and access. Just wanted to leave you with um, a slide here that has the URL. And again, I'm going to put some cards out on the tables. Please take a bunch of them, bring them back to your campuses, and print them out from the um, website and make more. Um, and I would encourage you all just to try to explore one of the discovery activities that is accessible just directly through the website and then consider um, enrolling in the MOOC. It's really targeted to all learners, whether you're a very beginner or advanced. We ask you to push your comfort level and explore and share what it is you're learning and how, how much value it meant to you. And that is um, the end of our slides. And um, thank you very much for your attention. I'm, Shereen and I are both here for the entire conference, so if you have questions, want to know more, please um, approach us and I'd love to talk about it. Are there any questions right now for Robin and Shereen or Lisa? Yes. Yes, it's definitely OER. Everything is Creative Commons licensed. Feel free to borrow. Um, we encourage faculty to take chunks of it, put it right into their courses, or link out to it. I just had a um, presentation with a number of courses yesterday at UB that are integrating it into their class. Anybody else? Maybe over drinks. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hey, Thank you. We had um, other entries who aren't able to join us, so I wanted to make sure that you were able to see these. And if you participated in the peer voting, you probably saw these in our, in our Facebook group. So um, these have all been uh, posted in, in Facebook. There is a group called Open SUNY Effective Practices. If you're not a part of that group and you are on Facebook, I would encourage you to join. Every year we post uh, all of the entries there. And um, that is where the voting takes place. So you just like the one uh, or multiple ones. If you're like me, I like to like them all. Um, and then the people in each track who receive the most votes are the ones uh, where we confer the awards. So without further ado, we're going to be doing some of that. So I've asked my colleagues to join me because um, they work very closely with many of these tracks. And so they will be the ones that are handing out the awards. And I'll just stand here and read it. So I love that. Um, <laughs> so I'll keep the tracks up here so that you can see this and you can understand what is uh, the content of each track. So we're going to start with online teaching and learning practices. So I'll ask Alex to come up. And the first place uh, award with the most votes, actually 40% almost of the votes, um, went to this entry. This is to Fast Community, Fostering and Sustaining the Community in a Three-Week Online Course. This was submitted by Lee Pierce, along with colleagues Becky Pat and Lori Fox from SUNY Geneseo. And I think Becky is going to claim the award for Lee today. Thanks. sneak behind the podium when Laura comes by. Um, we have also our honorable mentions. Uh, we, in the, in the online teaching and learning track, we want to recognize the following entries with a certificate of recognition. So as you already heard, submitted by Robin Sullivan and Cherie Van Putten, uh, again, University of Buffalo and SUNY Binghamton for their M Tech MOOC. Each of our online presenters today will also be receiving a certificate of recognition um, for their entries that they shared with you. Um, but in addition, we have Christine Marchese from Nassau Community College. Her effective practice was converting traditional assignments to appeal to varied learning preferences using digital tools. 
We also had Eileen O'Connor from SUNY Empire State College using immersive virtual reality for teaching and learning, and Elizabeth Johnson from Monroe Community College using VoiceThread in online college composition courses. That wraps up the online teaching and learning track. Deanne is gonna help me with online program partnership practices. So we had um, a couple entries in this category. The first place award uh, with the most votes goes to designing a synchronous learning environment that promotes community, interactivity, and equity of experience. This was submitted by Carolina Kim de Salamanca, along with Nathan whitley Grassi, Sean Hoppel, and Norana Cantrell from SUNY Empire State. I think Nathan is going <laughs> to... While Nathan is coming up to accept this award, I'll also mention that this entry was also recognized by the University of Central Florida's Teaching Online Pedagogical Repository an international resource that you'll be hearing more about at the end when we talk about other SUNY submissions, but that was, that was a nice achievement. We have another honorable mention in this category. We want to recognize Bridget Nettleton along with Lisa Schultz, um, both from Empire State College and Lisa Schachner from Rockland for their effective entry connecting pre-licensure and degree completion nursing programs. And as you heard, Bridget um, was on the, the Zoom. So Bridget will be receiving her certificate. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Dan hit it easy. Isn't he great? Dan Feinberg, everyone. Uh, as, as we expanded the tracks this year, uh, we had three tracks that did not receive community entries. So for those tracks, the Open SUNY team has identified effective practices, programs, or initiatives that exemplify each track, and we're going to recognize those. So Rob? Um, Rob is going to help with the course quality practices. And the first one here is um, being recognized as the Center for Learning and Teaching at SUNY Binghamton. Is Andrea here? Andrea? Yeah, could you? She didn't know this, but we're going to make her claim an award. So we're recognizing the CLT at Binghamton for your contributions to and impact on effective practices in ensuring online course quality. There you go, bring Sheree. There you go. So this is Center for Teaching and Learning. <laughs> there are going to be a lot of people in the room surprised when I call their names, because we didn't tell them this was happening. Surprise awards, yeah. Yeah, a little surprise. Thanks. We also want to recognize e-learning at NCCC for your contributions to an impact on effective practices in ensuring online course quality. I saw Donna. Is Lisa here? Both of you? Okay. Yay, Donna. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we're um, recognizing all the people who sat in the back. So it, so it seems to be happening. <laughs> and the, the last recognition in this tract is for the Monroe Virtual Campus for your contributions to and impact on effective practices in ensuring online course quality. I know Larry's here. Larry may want to bring up Tom and Andrea. It was a team effort. I think we should embarrass the entire team. <laughs> and Jamie. Sorry, Jamie too. See why we saved them for last? <laughs>
<laughs> Next, I'll ask Michelle to come up, take Rob's spot. We're going to recognize um, online student services and concierge practices, the first of which would be SUNY Canton Online for your contributions to effective practices and online student supports. Molly here? No? Next, we want to recognize the online MSW program at the University of Buffalo for your excellence in online student services at a program level. I'm not sure who's here to claim that. I know Brenda, you're, Brenda could claim it if she would like to. Would you like to? I know. You, <laughs> you came from Buffalo, so we're going to go with it. <laughs> We'll get it to them for sure, but just somebody who can accept it on their behalf. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to sit in the back again. <laughs> recognition in this category goes to Maureen Owens for your contributions to effective online student supports as the first Open SUNY concierge. <laughs> Thank you. We had to start somewhere and we started with Mo, so it's great. <laughs> I not write that down? I I'm so sorry. So, oh, right. Yeah. For this, right. So can you tell me how they, oh, they said FLCC online. Okay. Yeah. So I have the text, but not the campus. So for, <laughs> Ryan, for FLCC <laughs> online, for your support of the online student concierge program. You need to come up. <laughs> Bring as many people as you want. <laughs> Bring them all. <laughs> Thank you. Our last track is online enrollment and recruitment practices. So Kristen is going to help with this one. We would like to recognize Oswego Online Learning for your contributions to effective campus support practices in online enrollment and recruitment. <laughs> that's right, that's right. So Greg Ketchum is on Twitter. But in person, Teresa can accept. <laughs> and lastly, the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry for your contributions to effective campus supports practices and online enrollment and recruitment. And I think we have Chuck, right, and Brandon? Yeah. If you could. Who else? <laughs> Katrina. Yep. Oh, they're gonna make you do it, Katrina. Come on. There, there you go. I 
love when people come up and grab anybody they can. <laughs> if I'm doing it, you're doing it. So uh, before we depart, I just want to draw some attention to those folks who did submit to the topper, the Teaching Online Pedagog Pedagogical Repository. Every year we encourage all entries from the online teaching and learning track to submit to topper for consideration during their call for submissions. And this past year, we had three SUNY entries that were accepted. And again, this is an international online uh, open source repository, so it's a great honor. We already mentioned Carolina Kim de Salamanca for her entry. We also want to recognize Diane Hamilton from the University at Albany for her entry on student success in online learning through metacognitive prompting and reflective journaling. And Cheryl Levitt from SUNY Delhi for her entry using web conferencing and videos to improve employment interview skills. So if you would give those folks a round of applause as well. So there is the website for Topper. You can go and actually read those entries, uh, learn a little bit more about those authors. You can join our Facebook group, and you can also learn more about the Effective Practices Award program and see all the past um, entries and winners. So I just want to thank everyone who submitted this year, and we look forward to recognizing more and celebrating you next year. So thank you. Now you can eat. <laughs> Alex, do we have directives for lunch? <laughs> it is. We're breaking for lunch. What, are, what should we do? So is it right up? We're just going right in here. Okay. Okay. lunch or just enjoy lunch. <laughs>